Hi everyone, welcome to episode 28 of the Startup Playbook podcast. My name is Rohit Pargava and each week I interview successful founders, investors and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they use to succeed and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. In this episode, I interview Matt Allen. Matt is a mentor for early stage startups, an active angel investor and is one of the co-founders of Look Ahead Search, a technical recruitment agency based in Sydney and Melbourne. In the episode, Matt shares how to get a developer for your startup, why competition is validation, and when you should look to get investors on board. Without further ado, here is my interview with Matt Allen. Hi, Matt. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks for taking the time to be here. No worries. My pleasure. So uh, for those people that maybe aren't as familiar with you or your background, can you share a little bit of your story and what got you here today? Sure. So um, it all starts back in the early 90s when um, when the web was new and... Um, I, I started uh, developing for the web um, while I was still at high school um, and I had a keen interest in that kind of stuff. Um, it was the first time uh, when I was doing high school they offered three net computers which was uh, you know the advanced computers so took that, was the only person in my school to do it um, and uh, I think that was a bit of a leading indicator of, of some of the stuff that would happen down the line of the first person to do some of this stuff. So. I got a job out of school um, as a as a junior web developer in a in an agency in Sydney, and ended up working on things like um, you know McDonald's website, Vodafone website, Olympics.com.au, and other such such things when the web was pretty new. Um, lived through the first dot com boom. Um, I actually uh, had my first startup was a uh, hosting company, um, which at that point in time was a couple of desktop machines sitting on the corner of an ISP's uh, office. And it was um it, it was good. I um you know, we used to host lots of um lots of sites for um, the music industry as it turned out. Uh, for some reason or other they seemed to get wind of that and sites for bands, sites for music festivals and things like that. Um, and I guess uh, my career as a as a software developer um, spanned for about fifteen years and I had a couple of startups of my own um, that I sort of started and either exited uh, or shut down over that time um, and a, a little while ago about three and a half years ago I decided to uh, change track and um, and go from a software developer uh, with who I was running a small agency had some contractors um, and became a technical recruiter which is um, not a normal career path at all uh, but um, uh, my friend Steve Gillis um, who is now my business partner um, had always been part of the community that I was involved in, which was the, the Ruby community in Australia since around 2006. And he'd always been the one who'd been there every single month and um, it helped a lot of my friends with their careers. And I, I like people and I, I like people and I like, um, I like helping people and I, it turns out I like people more than code as it stands now. So for the last three and a half years, that's what I've been doing. And um, been down here in Melbourne for the last two and a half. And um, yeah, in, in that time, I've also been um, lucky enough to be able to start investing and advising in some startups. Um, so I sort of have seven at the moment or so um, that I've, I've helped sort of kick off. Most of them were the first, the first capital in with some other people um, and usually sit um, not in an official capacity, but in, a, in an advisor capacity, uh, not on any boards, just to help, uh, help them do what they need to do and get through that first precarious first couple of years. Sure. So going back to your first uh, first business that was in, in hosting um, and servicing the music industry, mm. how did how did that focus come about? Was that something that kind of naturally happened from going out and talking to different customers or was there something a bit more strategic? Um, in hindsight, um, I just, uh, I actually ended up doing um, the website for my favourite band at that time, Australian band called Grinspoon, which was... Um, they were sort of had come into, they won the Triple J Hottest 100 back in the day and I was just the guy that turned up and went, hey, I'm gonna do your website and bought their domain name and then chucked it on my hosting service. And then there was a um, there was a music festival back in the day called Home Bake, which is all Australian things. So I got them and you know, in true, uh, true junior style, I was basically doing it um, for mostly free. Um, Grinspoon bought me my first digital camera you know, home bake and all those things used to just give me uh, AAA passes where I could just sort of come and do whatever I want and was quite often using the digital camera on stage to take photos and put onto the websites. And, and um, so it was trying to just work like that. Um, there's actually a, a strong parallel between that and, and startups and that is, is that it is a, there are, everybody knows each other. And if you start helping 
one person, then it's highly likely that that will spread around. And if you're doing it purely for because you want to help them, then um, all of a sudden there'll be a lot of people who um, who probably would um, appreciate that and and um, will come and ask for some more help. Absolutely. In terms of like Grinspoon were fairly big. Yep. Uh, back, back in the day, how how did that first sort of point of contact come about? Um, I think my girlfriend at the time was a huge fan, you know, listened to Triple J, realised that, and because they were a local Australian band, we could just rock up, we'd just go to the gigs, and they were gigs in pubs at that stage. Right. So they were, they were gigs in pubs, um, and I um, just was kind of there all the time. You know, they were very, very accessible. You know, it's almost like a, um, it was almost like you could draw, the, again, that parallel to an early stage startup where the founders are, you know, really keen to talk to the people, their early users or their fans in this case. Uh, I said, hey, can I do this? And they're like, oh, well, we don't have one. Uh, okay, they didn't kind of really know. So I bought a domain name. In fact, it was registered in my name for quite a long time before um, the A&R guy from Universal was like, hey, we should probably transfer that into the band's name. I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> um, so it, 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 it hung around for ages. I was years and years and years I did that. And then sort of, you know, their support bands, we, I get to know them because they're the support bands there. And then at the festivals, you hang out with all the other bands. And when the web was quite new, there wasn't a lot of people who um, were, I guess, had a lot of experience in it. Not that I had a ton, but I had a little bit more than others. And that's, you know, quite often when you're starting out, that's kind of all you need. You only need to be one step further than the other people and and if you can offer to help them that's what happens absolutely right. and in terms of in terms of that whole giving back mentality like obviously that's um it's fairly common within the within the startup space but can you kind of share a little bit about more um maybe if you're earlier in in your journey um as as you probably were back back at that time um you didn't have a portfolio of, of startups that you were uh, potentially working with and, and those sort of things how can you give back to people and, and add value without necessarily having a lot of experience or, or things like that behind you. It's it's really good, and there's um uh, you know um. Currently, you know, when I when I run Look Ahead Search, which is my tech recruiting company, I speak to a lot of juniors, and you know, juniors are a very same thing. Startup founder who's just got an idea, junior who's just done a GA course or graduated from uni. It's like you don't have that that thing, but you've always got something, right? There's always something that you can give to someone or offer someone. They may not take it. Um, that you can offer to them that you probably know a little bit more than they do. Uh, you may know someone who, you know, who you've got a relationship with that if you think about it, you go, oh, actually, those two people will be really good. And um, I remember when, um, you know, I, I like connecting dots. I've always liked that. So I've always enjoyed, you know, having a head full of people doing stuff and going, oh, you should really talk to that person. And um, Obviously, when I turned in from a, a software developer who was just connecting people up, whether it be you know clients that I couldn't help with, people that I knew had the capability, um, turned into a recruiter who I do that for a living in a very specific domain now. But even outside that domain, I just I just want to connect connect those people. Um, and obviously, when I do it for a living, I do it in a commercial way, which is um it's really important. It's very obviously your reputation is like all the time, very much so when people are, are, are actually paying you for access to that network and to, to really try and connect the dots as strongly as possible. But to come back to your question, how do people who aren't, you know, who don't have 20 years of experience do that? Um, there's something, if you're really into something, um, then you've probably got more ideas about that specific domain than other people. And there's probably people who want to know more about it. So information is, is like the first thing you can give to someone um, you know, observations, information, or just a, an introduction to someone that you know that may be one step closer to where they need to go. Yeah, I think um, people may not introduce people um, for fear of um, that other person um, maybe not wanting it or, or being capable of handling it. So the best way to do that is to make sure that whenever you're introducing someone, you, you ask both parties if it's okay. I do that today. Obviously, in my commercial sense, that's extremely important. But even in my... Um, advisory capacity I'll actually get on the phone or I'll email or I'll SMS and I'll have two conversations about each other you know and make sure that everyone is expecting what's about to come yeah because as obviously someone who's you know everyone's got limited time you know I don't care if you're brand new everyone's only got a finite amount of time so you want to uh, seek permission to, to, to make that happen first um, it doesn't have to be you know war and peace it's just like hey I've got someone really interesting um, is kind of like if you got time for for a quick chat, and most people, I've 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 really had a no, yeah, um, really had a no from that process. Absolutely, and in terms of in terms of networks, like that's 
uh, you know, making sure that anyone that you're referring on is relevant as well. Right? Yeah. And it's, um, it's something that's, that's becoming super important for me as I'm, I'm actually narrowing my focus as I go along, as I realize where um, my value uh, is, is more valuable. My time is more valuable for some people because I know more stuff about stuff. So being a software developer for 15 years, being a recruiter for three years, being an investor for four or five of those, um, my focus is coming down. So even just this weekend, I had a, another friend of mine, another VC say, hey, here's a deck that I'm looking at are you able to help these people? And I actually responded and said, look, given my narrowing of focus and given that it was, a, it was for a company that's doing some stuff in the, the music industry and he knew that I had a background there and I said, look, given I've got a narrowing focus and that stuff was 20 years ago and I don't have a lot of contacts left over, um, I don't think I'm going to be able to help them. So um, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to help. And it's okay to say no, but it's very much a, you know, it's very much, it should be, you should be saying no because it's falling outside your scope and you don't want to waste their time. Yeah. You know, um, as an investor, uh, and especially as one who's got some, you know, some connections into some of the good VC firms like Blackbird that I work with. So there's a lot of people that come on my radar. Um, the worst thing I can do is waste their time by taking a whole bunch of their time and asking a bunch of questions and I have no intent of actually being able to help them. Yeah. So I'm very clear about that up front. Absolutely. In terms of in terms of investment, you mentioned that you're often the the first money in, yep. in into into uh, into a project. What what is it specifically that you look for um, that kind of helps you get a, get across the line of, of helping them to to putting money behind them? That's that's a good question. So um, um, over time, I've realised where my where I where my focus is starting to really lie, and that's in. It's in DevTools, so given my entire career has been around software development um, and web development, but you know, going all the way down, all the way down the stack into the infrastructure and up into the browser, and you know, obviously mobile and stuff like that, um, it's where I can have a conversation quite intelligently um, as far as a recruiter goes, or an investor goes, or even just just you know, just as as a user, as a consumer of these services, as a software developer, your tool chain to get that icon on the home screen of someone's phone, or to get a website up and keep it up. Um, there's a jigsaw puzzle of services behind the scenes there that uh, most people don't know about. Most consumers don't understand that when they click the, uh, the icon, the Evernote icon on their iPad, that there's hundreds of things that make that possible. Um, it's just an iceberg thing that most people who haven't built software before don't understand of you know, getting it getting something into production, keeping it running, monitoring it, you know, um, scaling it, uh, you know, all these kind of things are just problems that um, quite often uh, a small team will serve, uh, solve with some open source. And then as the team grows, the open source things quite often sort of um, aren't capable of doing what the sort of pro level teams need to do. And then they search for best practice and that kind of stuff. So um, for me, given that that's my focus now, and that I talk to developers all day long in my capacity as a technical recruiter, you know, that does from sort of junior developers right up to heads of engineering and CTOs. Um, like I, these are conversations like every single day. So if those are the people, so if they're not inside that scope, I will try and make sure that I can help them by introducing someone who might be in that scope. Um, but if they do fall into scope, then it starts a conversation. What are you working on? Where is it at? You know, what's stopping you from moving it to the next level? Um, and then we're actually putting some structure around place to try and help people do that in a methodical way. Now we're running some events, some breakfasts to help people um, be accountable. And, and every three weeks we're getting together who actually people actually have products that are side projects that they're trying to grow, you know, and then hopefully maybe get to the point where they can take some investment and do them as a full-time job. Um, and then at, even a, before that, where they don't have a thing, it's like, oh, I, I work at a, you know, a large software company in town and I've got this, I've solved this problem, I've seen this problem, I've solved this problem. I want to build a thing. We can actually help them move that along the process as well. So to answer your question, how do I go from help to investment? Um, time um, and relevant. So if it's relevant to, if, if I'm relevant to them, then I'll spend more time with them. And it could just be a coffee. It could just be half an hour coffee every, every couple of weeks to say, hey, how's it going? How's it going? What have you done? What are you working on this time? You know, what, what, what are you specifically working on to try and get to the next level? Um, which, you know, I, I've done this myself multiple times. I advise multiple startups. So it's easy for me to go, you should be kind of, this is what I'd focus on right now. Sure. Um, I mean, it, 
like in terms of a lot of early stage founders, a lot of them think that, um, or first time founders especially, that um, you know they have one meeting with an investor, they like the idea that they'll, they'll put money in mm-hmm. straight away. Um, what you mentioned time and, and catching up with coffee. What is it within those coffees and, and within that time period that, that you're looking for specifically? Um, the short answer is um, is behaviour. Um, so none of the investments I've made have been anyone that I didn't know for at least, I'm going to say 12 months. It's probably more likely to be years, plural, um, which, uh, you know, uh, which basically says to me that, um, that getting to know someone and how they react to feedback. So a lot of the time, especially given my narrow scope, these are technical people. They can build product. They can build the thing from top to bottom. You know, they can do the fancy CSS and deploy it to the cloud and it's a technical product. So these are non, not technical founders, they're very technical founders. But the problem is, is that quite often there's the business side of things that are quite new and exciting or scary for these people. So that's quite often what we're focusing on. It's cool, so you've got a thing, people use the thing. Have you turned on billing yet? Oh, and I'm afraid, you know, I can't do that. I'm like, all right, well, let's, let, how do we get from a user who uses your thing to paying for your thing to identifying you know whether they stick around and if they do stick around then how do we figure out what's special you know why are they sticking around or or worse if they don't stick around figure out why they don't and then modify things a bit but the thing i find with technical founders is that initially for a little while they're feature constrained like it doesn't do enough to to someone to change from an open source free thing to a paid thing but then they're quite often sales constrained they're quite often like "Mm, okay so i've got 50 customers all paying 50 bucks a month and that's cool. How do I get to 100 customers or even 60 customers? Like, how do we do that? And that's less coding, more business. Um, and I think that's something that I've, a, a bridge that I'm quite happy to span. I, I'm obviously talking to, in my capacity as, you know, in recruitment, I'm having big conversations with exec teams about building out their technical capacity or building out the capacity of their team. So business conversations is something that I'm pretty comfortable with. Um, technical founders sort of dragging them usually it's not by the scruff of the neck usually they want to see these metrics and if you can measure it and put on a dashboard and say can we move that over there a little bit this month they actually get quite excited they're like you mean I can do these things over here and then measure it and then off we go so yeah uh, those are the things that I that I generally end up focusing on um, obviously you know the non-technical founders that come across my radar it's more they're always like how do I do how do I build this like, well, that's a challenge for, for everybody, but most of my answers of those people are start with something off the shelf. You know, if you're building a marketplace, get a marketplace plugin for WordPress. And it's the people that generate the actual marketplace, not the software itself to start with. Absolutely. And I mean, I mean obviously you're, uh, you have been involved with the Founder Institute before, yep. uh, managing the program. And so you would have seen, uh, you know, a wide group of people coming in and obviously pitching to you for uh, for investment and, and those sort of things as well. What are some of the, the patterns that you've seen between um, people that go on to build successful businesses and, and potentially raise funds from you or, or from other investors versus people that kind of fall away? Uh, that's a good question. So, um, yeah, so I've been uh, a director. Uh, I've been involved with Founder Institute since it came to Australia, both as a founder initially. So um, me and two co-founders did the program I uh, came first, second, third in our class. I we won Sid start off the back of that, um, lots, lots of years ago now, um, and then came back as a mentor and then ran it here. So yeah, and Founder Institute is absolutely aimed at g- mostly non-technical people. Um, it's a part-time course which allows people who still work at the bank or anywhere to go. I've got this thing. I want to try and pr- validate it and prove it. See what happens. So. Um, my, the graduate, uh, so I've, got, I've had made two investments in two, two companies of my two classes here in Melbourne. Uh, the first one was an absolute non-technical founder. However, the things that he had done to validate his idea were eye-opening. Um, he had an idea around social uh, user-generated content in an e-commerce platform. Um, again, come back to networks. Um, his dad was friends with the CEO of a jeans company here. I don't know which one it was Jeans West or Just Jeans, one of those two. And he managed to convince him to allow him to inject a little bit of code on their website. Um, and he's, he, he's not a developer. He'd done one, it failed computer science, like it failed is part of his uh, degree to do with that twice. So he certainly was not a developer. But what he did have was 
some chance that he managed to install this bit of thing and actually had some like A-B testing that he'd run over a Christmas period. And it showed me that, that in that in that sort of environment, it had had a meaningful impact on the outcome. And he had a spreadsheet with 170 brands, I think it was, that he'd cold called every single one of them and had been tracking the responses and following up with them. So, you know, couldn't code, well, said he couldn't code, but managed to, you know, get permission to inject this little thing, which actually then got, he paid someone else to build a bit of, product to sort of squirt some in, um, you know, uh, Instagram stuff into this thing and watch the conversions go up. So I was like, okay, well, this kind of works. He wasn't quite sure technically, but the, the, the chance, the results said so. Um, so then I introduced him to a friend of mine who run a software company who were in the game or who are in the game of uh, being able to help some startups, you know, build their product, um, take a small equity chunk, you know, pay for some and, and, uh, and that, that was, that's worked really well and it's going, still going really, really well. Um, so if you're a non-technical founder who, um, who needs to, you know, who wants to have that kind of conversation, um, it's about showing, showing what you've done within the scope of things you can do and hopefully pushing out a little bit, you know, like, so coming and say, I'm not a developer, but I managed to inject a bit of JavaScript in a WordPress theme and kind of got it to work. Like that shows me that you're willing to go, ah, oh, that's not my job. So I'm just going to sit here and wait. Uh, the second class um, were some technical founders. So they were mates of mine who are developers. They're DevOps guys. Um, and they had the beginnings of a technical product. And they said, look, we suffer this problem every day. We go out to a consult, uh, go out to a client. And we're like, hey, so what does your infrastructure look like? And they're like, oh, here's a thing that we printed out three three years ago that kind of looked like this. Well, that's what no, it look. So they've built a system that actually draws in real time your, what your cloud infrastructure looks like. Um, so they are, you know, had the skills to build that. But what they didn't have, and they recognized that they didn't have the, the absolute validation and the business stuff behind it to go, how do we, what do we need to do to, to turn this into a SaaS product, to turn it into a thing that can actually grow month on month and, and, and do that? So, um, so I said to them, you should come and do Founder Institute. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, I think you should. So they both founders stopped doing product, came and did businessy stuff and came first and second in the class and went from the guys, you know, the, the geeks who, you know, who who had a product and could kind of talk about with it, but were down in the weeds explaining the nuts and bolts of it to guys who could pitch at the end at a very high level, explain exactly what it was there and what it was doing and you know, and raised we raised we raised a good good lot of money off the back of that. Sure. Um, one of the things that you kind of briefly touched on there was uh, people almost realizing where their weaknesses were. Mm. Um, is that is that common or is that, do you, do you think that that's something that uh, people can develop over time or is that something that you need externally, you know, advisors or, or people to kind of point those things out for you? Oh, that's a, that's a really great question and very, um, very relevant. I just um, finished listening to an audio book called uh, Ego is the Enemy, which, you know, has a lot of reflection of people over time that have, you know, forced their way into things, you know, had success, rightly or wrongly, and then, you know, fallen down overwards, um, afterwards. Um, and it's also something that I think about all the time is like, well, like if you were to sort of drop your skills on the table and where they clump together is like, where's the bits that you focus on? And, and for me personally, I'm sort of rising up the stack from a software, a junior software developer to a senior developer to a, you know, a running an agency to a founder to, you know, and on the recruiting side going up the stack. And even in my, my company of knowing where me and my business partner skills complement each other. Um, you have to be kind of aware enough to do that and understand it's like, oh, we're, we're pulling in the wrong direction. We're butting heads because we're different. Instead of butting heads, how do we go, well, you do this and I'll do that. Um, I think there are a lot of people, founders have to, it's a balance, right? Because you need to push through some stuff that you don't like until you've got people around you who can compliment you. So that you can't just go, I don't do that and then not do it. You need to go, I can't, it's not my forte. Maybe I should give it a crack. And then if I really suck at it, I'll go find something that can help. And that tenaciousness of that identifying first going oh, you know I'm really bad at this um, some people so uh, some people go I'm really bad at this and stop so to come back to your question is what happened to all those other people I think a lot of them just went I'm really bad at this and stop um, which makes you you know you've done startups not before it's like yeah man we're bad at all kinds of stuff and you know and my the things I'm really good at is such a small small portion of what needs to be done you can't go, I'm only going to do that and not do the rest. You have to push things to the point where there's a bit of momentum and you can convince someone who's got that other complementary skill set to maybe come along and help. 
it's the it's the the problem that you know every single startup on earth suffers when you're only one person. I do know some people that can do everything, but just because they can doesn't mean they should. In fact, there's only a certain many hours in a day. And when I invest in startups, I'm very much very empathetic to not burning out, having hit the wall several times myself. Burning out is is you know is when you're finished doing the things you want to do and have to do the stuff you have to do. And they take even more effort and you kind of they go slow and you suck at them and you feel bad and you need to balance this stuff up and surrounding yourselves with people that you know can help you there or at least take you out for a beer and, and understand it is really important absolutely in terms of bringing on people with, with complementary skills i mean um obviously like the majority of conversations that i have with early stage founders are with non-tech people that yep. are looking for tech co-founders yep. uh you deal with with technical people all day what you know what is it that gets technical people excited in in an idea whether to jump on as an employee or as a potential co-founder um another another great question something that i i think um you know if there's one thing i want i want you yeah, i'd like your listeners to take away from here it's it's is that technical people developers are generally very pragmatic they're very analytical they build things that are you know reduced down to ones and zeros there's there's different ways of doing stuff but ultimately there's an outcome or there's not. Um, and a lot of them are very, very risk averse. In the current market where if I had hundreds of developers today in Melbourne, I could get them all a job. Like I know there's that many roles open. Uh, so you'd think that they'd be you know, fancy free and go, yeah, I'm gonna come and do your startup and if it doesn't work, then cool, six months time, I'll just go get another job, it doesn't matter. That's not how it works. It's just not how it works. They're actually like, huh, so, uh, what have you done to uh, you know prove that that you you want me to walk away from my you know six figure job um, to come and do this crazy idea with you? But it's just an idea. Like oh, I, you know I've just met you. I, I don't really know who you are. Like it seems good, but you know there's a bunch of stuff packed in there that I don't understand. Um, and referring back to that that first investment uh, that that I that I made with uh, the guys from Tagged was um, they had reduced the potential risk of a technical person coming to help, right? So they'd spoken to a bunch of potential customers and had great feedback. That hacked together something that was way outside their domain expertise um, domain and managed to actually get some results that were very, very strong. It was like, if I was to manage, if I could build a platform that did this instead of this nasty bit of JavaScript that I paid you know, a freelancer person to do, then maybe we could, you know, with, with some technical people who actually could help build the product, we could, Get these 170 people I've spoken to across the line. Even if we've got 10 of them to start with, it'd be a great little thing. Um, so if you're talking to technical people, it's about a combination of sales, but they're also very anti-sales, right? These pragmatic people, they're also kind of, especially ones that have been around for a while and have dealt with it business in quotes, <laughs> you know, even in their, 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 their capacity um, in a, in a, as an employee, a very skeptical people go, oh yeah, it'll only take two weeks, it wouldn't we'll be done. We know as software developers that nothing just takes two weeks and it's never done. So there's a balance of kind of appreciating the fact that there's probably an iceberg worth of technology back there to get that little icon on the screen or to get that customer to pay for it, that nothing's ever fast and that these people are pragmatic and kind of cynical. So the more you can do to go, hey, look, I've done all this stuff, here's all the things I've done, that, you know, and if they look at it and go, oh, I wouldn't want to do that. I certainly don't want to pick up the phone and call 170 different, you know, marketing managers around town. That sounds like a horrible job, but you've done it. And the outcomes was like, if we, if we can get something out the door, then it might be a really good thing. Absolutely. I mean, one of the, again, going back to one of the biggest things that I see with a lot of founders that don't really move the needle at all is... I need a technical co-founder to build out the product. I can't talk to anyone until I have that because yeah. I have nothing to show. But if your skill set is to sell, then you should be going out there and, and selling, right? So you should be doing your side of, of what your expertise is and then bringing someone on to, to help validate that. It's, um, I think you and I touched on this the other night at Founder Institute, and that is, um, look, as a founder, you've only got one job and it's to sell. Initially, it's, um, and the, the order with which you sell is up to you, but ultimately, in the early days, it'll be um, a customer or a potential customer. Uh, it'll be a founder. Uh, it'll be you know um, it'll be investors potentially, uh, employees after that. Uh, you know, and customers are an underlying theme along here. You know, you need to be effectively selling or selling your idea to them, uh, and hopefully eventually a product. But 
it is a sales process and everybody who's ever done sales knows that it's never, you never walk in and make a sale and you're done. And if it does, it's likely that that's going to be not going to last for a long time. So, you know, understanding the customer in a sales process is really important, right? Like when we um, help build out some of the teams for some of the best software teams around Sydney and Melbourne, you know, the best success we have is when we are able to get close to that team and understand what it is, not just the product, but what it is the team is selling, what it is that we can actually uh, help by telling that story and, and, and really sort of selling it hard. Um, well, not selling it hard, selling it soft, actually. You know, it's like once you understand what they want, then you don't have to do a hard sell if there's got good components in there. So as a founder who's got an idea, you know, uh, you're going to do some work to try and validate it and try and, you know, uh, explore who these customers are in parallel talking to, talking to people. So you mentioned before about, you know, working on it and not telling anyone. That is the worst idea. Like, um, you should tell everybody. There is in the... You know, in the uh, in the book Ego is the Enemy, they talk about you know ego um, being all talk and, and no go. And and in in starting up a startup, there's there's periods where you have to actually talk to a lot of people and refine what you're talking about and get it on message. And hopefully, if you get that right, then there'll be some people who you can swing into sort of action mode as well. But you know, they're not they're never mutually exclusive. But you can't just do action without any kind of salesmanship. And without any someone using the product, there's no point building a product that no one knows about. There's no point having an idea that you can't tell anyone about. No one's going to steal your idea. It's a really important thing. Um, I've just never seen it happen. Yeah. Um, most people are like, you try and tell them their idea, and the minute you shut up, they'll tell you about their idea, right? And they're not really, you know, the, the chances are they don't even listen to your idea. The chance of them going and then going and implementing it is minimal to none. So we're not telling anyone, all you're doing is having you're not getting you're not moving ahead yeah well i mean i i think we i think again we kind of touched on this during the founders institute event was if someone is going to replicate your ideal and execute on it better than you anyways um it, it's going to happen regardless of whether that's happening now whether that's three months from now whether that's six months from now because yeah. if you're successful people will copy absolutely so happens all the time and like we see it even in the the, the dev tool spaces you know there's open source stuff that some people have cobbled together and then, you know, it works, does a thing and then there's, you know, commercial versions of it and then there's commercial versions of what you've done where they've gone and raised stupid amounts of money in the valley and all of a sudden you're like, oh my, uh, you know, that our competition are now have $20 million in the bank, what are we going to do? And the short answer is, is focus back on what you do. You know, continue to surprise and delight your current customers. You know, ask them to, you know, find a way to, to tell them without even asking them that they're going to tell other people about it. And, and that's a really good way to, to create a, a strong foundation of people that really like what you do. Absolutely. And I think competition is actually a good thing more often than not. Like, you know, often it's, it's a validation that your problem is big enough to, to solve. Um, funnily enough, I was watching uh, Silicon Valley um, on, on the plane back last night. Um, and the, the, I think uh, Gavin Belson had, had just put in $250 million to an, a quiet end frame. Yeah. Um, and they said, oh, this is great because this, this you know, puts a, puts a valuation on, on what, what it is that we're trying to solve. Um, yeah. And often, I think a, a lot of times people look at competition as, oh crap, someone else is doing it. I can't do it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Um, you know, obviously uh, Silicon Valley being a parody of, well, you know, sometimes a parody <laughs> and stupid big numbers. And, you know, it's, it's something that, that's um, on the forefront of, of our mind at the moment, especially in the space that I work in, is that is, you know, everybody's trying to do these massive big, you know, optimize for unicorns. Um, but it leaves a lot of really good potential businesses that don't even get a start. Um, you know, when you're talking to people that are taking investment, you know, the story you tell these people is needs to be the story you're comfortable with, right? And um, especially for some companies, you know, being a, a, a stupidly hundreds of million or billion dollar companies is not actually a good outcome. Like most investors won't back a lifestyle business. Like then no one, you know, building a, a fish and chip shop on the corner, is, you know, only has a certain amount of scale. But if you've got a scalable business that, you know, um, that can get, can grow faster than, you know, the, the people you put inside it, um, then there are still people who, who find that exciting. And we certainly, especially in our space, where it's where there's a couple of outlier dev tools that are extremely valuable, but there's a bunch with small teams operating really well with a big customer base um, that that can that are just they're amazing companies, and you'd be you'd be proud to be involved with them. Um, 
So knowing who, knowing what your end game is and what your values are and what you want to do and what your business partners or your, your co-founders values are and then combining those up into the values of the company and then aligning all those things with the people you talk to, both customers, uh, investors and you know partners is, is really important to, to make sure that you're all pulling in the same direction. Absolutely. Um, I mean, obviously, there's no one right answer to this to this question. But at what stage should startups look to start taking on investment or look to start bringing on an, an angel investor like yourself? Um, it's in Australia. It's highly unlikely that you get investment on an idea. It's highly unlikely that someone. I've got this great idea. Um, quit your job. Off you go. Um, it just doesn't seem to happen. Um, it's certainly not part of the way I do it either. So, you know, you're gonna need to do something. Um, but again, that something can vary from some hacky stuff to kind of validate the problem and, and validate that, that the results that you're expecting happened. Uh, in my space, it's it's built the damn thing. You've got the capability. If you're sitting on the couch watching Silicon Valley, you could also be sitting on the couch actually coding and deploying this thing in production and trying to figure out whether it solves the problem. Um, you know, there's a big gap between, you know, coming out an idea, creating a solution, launching a solution, and trying to get a customer. Like, they're kind of three or four chunks along the way. Um, for me, if you can get to that first point, you know, my next thing will be, cool, go get some more, exactly the same. Forget about, forget about the rest of the features for now. If you've got one, there's probably 10. So spend all your time trying to get nine more people that behave and have expectations exactly like that one you've got. And then if you can get 10, you might be able to get 20, you know? And at a certain point in time, you're like, cool. And now at a certain time, you've got a bunch of people who do have, you know, greater expectations. So you build the product out a little bit more, you know, there's revenue, hopefully there's revenue. And again, that, at that point in time, again, risk reduction, right? So investors are all about um, risk and VC is risky, but it's not stupidly risky, right? It's not, in Australia especially, it's not like I've got this crazy idea, I've met you once, shut up and take my money. It's I've got this crazy idea and here's what I've been doing and um, you know and here's some updates along the way and uh, you know I've seen you out and about in town at meetups or whatever and hey I just want to tell you I've just you know last month I said it was yeah, this month I'm doing that cool all right and it's more likely that someone will help you if they've seen you know your trajectory um, and again it's harder if you're not if you can't build a product yourself but that's your first challenge right so so one of the one of the ways to mitigate that risk is to have a, a really great team mm. around you. Um, what is it that, and I guess we, we kind of touched on this earlier in terms of finding additional co-founders, but what is it specifically that people should look for in, in building that team around them? Yeah, um, having been, you know, having had multiple co-founders across the time, for me, I'm um, reflecting on that is, is that you need your, um, you know, your values and your kind of, um, your values for your personal values and then the values rolled up into the company to all align with each other. Um, and the thing about, I know about startups is they change and people change. You know, one of my startups, we, I founded before I started a recruiter, it was in Sydney, I was in Sydney, I was a dev guy and you know, the, the initial conversations are like, we think we can get this in and out really quickly. We think we can build a product that, that will, you know, potential acquisition really quickly. And that was kind of what I signed up for. As it turns out, that wasn't the case. It was gonna be a long, hard slog and and I moved to Melbourne, so I ended up, you know, getting out of that one. Um, and they're off to the races, you know. They, I wish them every single, um, you know, every single piece of goodwill in the world because they went, actually, you know, no, we're into this thing. It's our life's work. Let's do it. I'm like, Great. You know, please, you know, let, don't let me get in the way because that's just what it is. And we structured, you know, we put structure in place to do that legally and, and, and so forth. And, um, yeah, so building the team is obviously important. Um, again, it's a sales, a salesy kind of convincing. Um, the people you start with aren't necessarily the people who will go all the way through this thing. It, it, it happens, it, it changes. And most of my, uh, the people that I know that are um, investors, you know, a lot of their time is spent dealing with founding teams that have, you know, that have different, that have different agendas. So um, a thing that we use um, in Look Ahead um, introduced to us from, one of our, our newest uh, people, one of our newest team members, is called Radical Candor, which is, you know, being able to actually have a robust conversation about a thing without offending each other. And I think most founders' blow-ups I've seen has been about, you know, you said something and offended me, and now we can't talk anymore. 
and you know that's really bad for the business and you know even you know I, I'm, I'm a victim of it you know I'm not a victim I'm, I'm you know I should have behaved differently as well sometimes but being able to have robust discussions you know is a core part of any team the best teams I hire for around town are the ones that can talk about the thing and not get angry about you know the specific instance of the behavior that caused the thing you know and talk about it aground and move on yeah. um, is really really key to the getting a team together to actually functions really well yeah which is why uh, oftentimes investors say that they look for people that have longer relationships because mm. often you've had those blow-ups over time and you, you can kind of manage that but um, again something that you touched on was some of the legal structures that you put in place yeah. to uh, to help facilitate someone leaving obviously things kind of change over time but was that um, was that mainly around vested vested uh, yeah it's it's mostly around so the the things that I've taken away so my first startup that went for six years um, there was none of that, right? It was just straight up equity, straight down the line. Uh, everybody owned everything, um, and off we went. Um, over time, especially like, and, and most of the structure I want to put in place is to protect others from me sometimes. You know, I know that, that I'm really good starting things up, and then, you know, over time, if things slow down a little bit, that my focus can, can you know, can potentially be pulled away. Um, so that actually caused a bunch of hassle because there was no structure to, with which to undo things. Uh, since then, we've, I've solved that problem by putting in these vesting schedules, which are commonplace here. Um, it's usually, for the first 12 months, everybody has their shares, but there's an illegal agreement that says in the first 12 months, if you don't continue to do these things and everybody's got their own set of things, then we can have a discussion at the board level to say, hey, this ain't working out. We'll take all our shares back. And then over the next three or four years, they'll start to vest on a quarterly basis. So you, you get more and more and more. So it's called a cliff and then a vesting period. Um, of course, it only works if you're having the conversation along the way, right? You don't want to get to month 11 and a half and go, oh, we think that you've been a bit shit. Now give our shares back. That's yeah. just not going to work. Yeah. Uh, so, and I learned this the hard way. Like I've had these hard conversations and I, I wish, no, I put the, wish them upon nobody. But having the structure there was at least like, cool. So yes, I agree that I haven't done my thing or you, know, or you get to the point where you can at least you know, figure out where it is. You undo everything. Shares get re readjusted around equity and effort is now hopefully aligned. And that's ultimately what you're looking for is the equity and effort to be in lockstep with each other along the way. And it's interesting in a software business where software needs to be built and then it needs to be sold and then it you know, still needs to be built and then it needs to be sold. So there's this, it's never equal. You know, um, and it's something that I think, going back to the beginning about you know finding that technical person, is that they're like, hmm, you're going to need me to really, you know, I'm going to have to put in hundreds of hours to get to even to that first product, that first thing, before you can go and do your thing because we've got nothing to sell yet. You know, which is not a not true. It's not it's not a zero or or hundred percent thing. It's always blending. Yeah. But as a technologist, you're like, yeah, I'm front loading my risk here. Um, you know, I've got to do all this thing and then I hope that you're still paying enough attention and caring enough about it to go and sell it. And, you know, p selling it to customers, customers always want other stuff. So it's never done. So <laughs> putting structures in place to be able to handle the ebb and flow of responsibilities and so forth is, is, is kind of critical. It is the divorce agreement, you know, before it's the prenup. Um, and when you take investors, they'll make you reinvest every single time. That's right, cool, I'm going to give you some money, but you own nothing. We go back to zero and a lot of founders are like hey what do you mean nothing i'm like well if you're going to take x millions of dollars off someone they want to make sure that you've you've got at least a 12 months in you and then another three years again and it will reset again and again and again so if you're going to go down that bit that that path be ready for that absolutely and i mean if you're not willing to have those conversations or those conversations don't go too well at the start that's probably an indication that that's not a really good fit anyways it's it's usually what I found. It's an indication of it's a it's an indication of a potential misunderstanding, or that someone's like yeah, like I'm not in, I'm not into it as much as I thought I was. Mm. Um. So yeah, and, and you know, vesting periods are either an incentive or a disincentive, right? They're either like oh, that's a long time away. I'm not sure I can slog it out for twelve months. I'm like oh, okay, well don't, you know, or okay, cool, we're all going to go and do this thing, and once twelve months rolls over, you know, it's. We're all we're all equal, and you know, need to get there. And you know, you've experienced this yourself as well. So it's, it's you know, twelve months is a long time in startup land. Is and then especially in that first twelve months, yeah, there is some shit you got to go through. You know, and you want to be able to go well. If it turns out that 
we cop a blow for whatever reason mm. and one member you know peels off and, and disappears down you know thing then you've got you can you want to at that point in time you're like cool so just letting you know that you're now in violation of this stuff and you've got you know the next quarter to fix it otherwise we're gonna we're gonna kick this thing off you know and just be start those conversations which is not antagonistic it's like hey you know this here if i did the same thing i'd want you to do it to me i'm giving you permission to call me if i'm not behaving what you want but do it sooner rather than later yeah um and it's just those first 12 months are just brutal absolutely and it's, it's not meant to like penalize an individual or something or, or no. kind of shackle you to something it's more to protect the company as a whole it, right? it is it is and and once you get investors in there they will need that protection they're like i don't want some person owning a chunk of this company who hasn't participated to get here you know one of my companies I, i'd done a whole bunch of work up front but had definitely you know switched off in the ladder where the other founders actually got excited by that phase of the company where i was like hmm, now i've kind of built the product and i raised some money and did some things and that was kind of like it popped out the end of the things that i really um, feel like i've got the capacity to do so you know, we had that conversation it was not pleasant but it's done now and we're done and we move on and they're cool they're they're growing it like crazy and i'm i'm out and it allows me to focus on some new things now which is which is sort of everybody kind of won in the end um but yeah that structure certainly helped absolutely speaking of new things yes i uh, would love to chat to you about your new project pick yeah. and shovel can you kind of share a little bit about who's involved and and what it is sure so um Speaking of narrowing of focus, um, initially some of my early uh, energy investments were uh, things that I had, had some experience in but were kind of on my periphery. They were some zero add-ons. I'd been in the zero ecosystem as a developer. Uh, there was some payment stuff. There was that kind of thing. But over time, um, the kind of founders that seemed to come up to me and ask me for advice have been these dev tools founders. They're the ones who are in the software teams that I help build. I've either maybe gotten them a job or I've put a person in their team and we struck up a rapport and they're like, hey, I've got this problem that I've solved over here and we actually use it in my team. And then I kind of gave it to those guys over there, my mate who works in that team and it works for them. I'd really like to understand how I can take this from a sidey to a, to, a, to a business, you know? So, um, or, you know, they're, they're great. I love those conversations. So Pick and Shovel is, is actually wants to do that on a full-time basis. Um, obviously, um, it works really well. Look ahead, look ahead is having conversations with um, you know, 50 plus developers a week about their careers. And a lot of these people have uh, interesting things they're working on and that you know, it's what they use to push themselves forward when it's outside scope of work, uh, outside the, the scope of their work. Um, so Pick and Shovel is uh, myself, uh, Glenn Gillen, who built the add-ons place at Heroku. Um, Heroku is a platform as a service um, spun out or got bought by Salesforce and anyone who's deployed something you know has probably used it to at least get started with um and lachlan donald who is the ex-cto of 99 designs one of the um you know early early site point companies and um got a major investment from excel um he grew the team from a founder to i don't even know how big they are 50 huge, 60 yeah. huge uh, out of richmond so the three of us combined have got an interesting set of skills which are um technical grounding and um, uh, LOX is definitely the least post-technical out of all of us. But what we really enjoy is helping technical founders take that early stage idea and grow it into a um, scalable and sustainable business. So it'll consist of a fund that we're actually able to, to in invest that first check in, um, which will allow these founders to actually stop working full time, um, come and hang out with us and other like-minded individuals so we're focusing purely if you sell to developers that's our market so if you sell to other developers that's our market so um, my, my portfolio has already got some of those in it uh, glenn's got some lox has got some um, so they'll we'll all put them on the same roof so we're gonna have a space so we'll be able to come out and hang out with people who are selling to the developers um, and we plan on doing um, 10 of those a year probably five in the first year um, so we have experience with um, obviously the technical side of things, which is less of a concern, although scaling cloud infrastructure and scaling teams is, is sort of what we're really, really good at. Um, Glenn actually had this observation as he was in building the Heroku add-ons marketplace, which were usually small one, two and three person technical teams that, you know, built a product that the Heroku add-ons marketplace would click into and help them scale. Was that the exciting part of these teams is when they get to um, 
what the people from Y Combinator call default alive, or basically you've, you're cash flow neutral. You can actually, every month, you've got enough revenue to pay for infrastructure, pay for your salaries, and kind of, you know, take a bit of a breath and go, cool, well, we've, we're not gonna run out of capital. We're not gonna run out of runway, we're good. You actually saw an inflection point where they actually, their, their revenue went up at a steeper rate because you could start making strategic decisions and partnering with people and not just scrambling to you know try and try and hustle to try and get that you can actually you know go for the best types of customers rather than just the ones that are right there, and we've seen that happen too um, in our investments. You know we've 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 put in one round of capital. They've spent that money. They've put a bit of an R and D tax grant in there. They've managed to bring the revenue up to the costs, and now they're growing their business at the pace with which the company can sustain, and it's super exciting because um, it doesn't take long before and if you've got a good product that is being spread by you know, these teams that use it. And we've seen now with some of them, because we're two and three years down the track, that it becomes a, their tool of choice. They move jobs and take them with them. And all of a sudden you've got a new client, um, a new customer. So they kind of use this land and expand thing where they'll pop up inside, a, you know, inside one team, inside a big company, and then pop across teams and then propagate because developers and their tools are, you know, they, that's what they do. It's, it's their, their tool chain. It's like a tradie, tradies youth full of things. They just take them with them to the next job. Um, so Pick and Shovel with um, um, Glenn and, and Lox and myself are focusing on helping technical founders uh, start that product. And we've got, um, we're doing some events to help people who might you know, think they want to do that, sort of get to the point where they can move it along. And um, you know, there's some minimum um, uh, revenue requirements that we have. Um, the investment should give them an 18 month run day and we want to actually help them through that. So by providing the space, the expertise, more experts that we're importing from around the world to come in and spend a lot of time with these uh, founders and other founders who are sort of plus minus 12 months. Uh, we find, we know that the ecosystem here is really, um, really important. And the reason we've chosen this is A, we have deep experience and B, um, the lack of good infrastructure in Australia means that we are early adopters of um, cloud infrastructure, which means we build software in modern techniques um, and we are at the early adopters, part of the early adopters curve here. So um, the teams that I build on a daily basis are people that are actually inventing things to help software teams get better at what they do in the new way of developing and deploying software. Fantastic. So for anyone that wants to uh, wants to find out more about Pick and Shovel, what's what's the best way for them to do? Um, Pickandshovel.co is um, is where they should go and have a have a poke around. We are running. Um, some events for people that, um, for technical founders who have that sidey, who haven't quite got to the point where they can have revenue yet um, to help them get to that point. And then uh, we have another set of, uh, uh, we call them accountability breakfasts, where who are, if you are in that point and you want us to uh, help you move the needle a bit on, on revenue or whatever it is and help you focus on that. And the whole point of those is to get to the point where if you've done this on the side, and you would like to turn it into a business and a, and a startup company, then we're, um, we'll have the capability to actually make that happen. And, um, you know, we'd really like to, um, to see people who, who want to grow, you know, long-term sustainable companies here. Um, it's not traditional VC. It's not put it in, burn it all, um, you know, go raise some more. We're not optimizing for the next round. We're optimizing for, you know, good growth and, 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 and you know, cash flow um, to be able to grow the company. It doesn't preclude something being a runaway success and having and going down that path, it actually doesn't stop it at all. It just it just means that we're, our focus is to grow companies that are, can, we call them, I call them big, small companies. Um, you know, the product can go big, but the company can actually stay, you know, if you want it to, relatively small and, um, and service these types of, you know, developers as customers, companies. Fantastic. And Matt, anyone who wants to personally follow you, follow what you're up to, get in touch, what's the best way for them to, to do that? Um, I probably tweet too much at, um, <laughs> at, at Matt Allen. Um, uh, lookahead.com.au is, um, is our, our recruiting company and um, matter.io is, um, is my site that I've sort of chucked up a little bit of history of me if it's um, if you want to go and explore some of the other companies that I've sort of helped along the way yeah but um, yeah follow me on Twitter if you like I don't know weird banter <laughs> <laughs> perfect I'll make sure all of those links are on the show notes Matt thank you so much for your, for your time and insights today it's been, it's been fantastic it's a pleasure thanks for having me Thanks for listening to episode 28 of the Startup Playbook podcast. You can find the show notes of my interview with Matt, along with a curated list of tools and resources for startup founders at startupplaybook.co. As always, you can join the conversation through our Twitter account. The handle is at Playbook Startup. 
In the next episode, I interview Simon Kant. Simon is the co-founder and managing director of ReInventure, Westpac Bank's $50 million VC fund. In the episode, Simon shares why referrals are important to investors, sustaining versus disruptive startups, and the roles corporate should play in the startup ecosystem. Don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you at episode 29 next week.